I got into a little bit. I sat on the committee that uh, finalized the English translation of the Qatabi Actas into a four-year-long committee activity. Probably the most interesting period of my life. Discovering, as we discovered, six House members were working on the revision. Uh, and so many things unfolded by looking at the Arabic, the way the Guardian had translated the Arabic of the original. He translated about 37%, so that gave us a kind of a model of how to approach the whole tone of the Akdas. And then he also made this synopsis and codification where he listed all the laws and miscellaneous ordinances of the faith. Before, before he passed away, he'd finished that by the middle of the, of the World Crusade. That was like 1957. Terrific. Do you have any questions or any subjects that you're particular? I mean, I've got things I could talk to you about, but you may have some interests of your own you'd like to raise. Oh, that's good. We're all satisfied with everything. Everything's going well. No problems in your lives or anything. <laughs> Being a Baha'i youth at this time is, uh, is challenging in several ways. One of the ways, I think, is, of course, we have the plan before us, and you've got all these various activities of the plan, and you've got institutions of the faith telling you concentrate on the plan and do the plan. That concentration on the plan and doing the plan is a collective activity of the cause. But at the same time that we have collective responsibilities, corrective duties, we've got individual responsibilities and individual duties. And the plan doesn't include them because it's assumed that you would be looking at the individual responsibilities on your own. For instance, there's nothing in the plan that says, say, the obligatory prayer. So does that mean that's not part of the plan we should uh, eliminate it? I don't think so. So this is the point. The, the recitation of the verses of God morning and evening is another aspect of the, of the individual um, obligations. We have fasting annually, the, entering into the spirit of the fast and learning how to fast. Those are individual responsibilities. So. The House of Justice didn't naturally include those in the plan because they're part of the inherent in the revelation itself. Maybe the key one, I mean, when you look at the Akdas, the first line of the Akdas is the first duty of anybody that's alive is to recognize the manifestation of God for this day. So, I don't know, most of you, I presume, are already Baha'is or Baha'izadeh's or by Baha children of Baha'is or however, however it works out. <laughs> Uh, that's also a challenge, is kind of coming alive to the faith on your own so that it's not my parents' faith, but it's our faith. I think we all had to face that in Haifa, like hundreds of kids came through and suddenly they found out this is my religion <laughs> also, you know. Most of the, the girls were a little faster at it. The guys, usually when they were 19, they, they had this suddenly the switch goes on about <laughs> spiritual life and uh, laws that I need to obey in order to survive here. <laughs> That's quite pretty interesting. <laughs> so this uh, top of all of the individual responsibilities is the duty to proclaim the faith at all times to be considering proclaiming the faith. Use wisdom, but this is something we want to be doing. Now we have cycles of growth and teaching and things going on in the collective activities. But apart from that, the individual has a responsibility to become incarnate spirit, to radiate light, to touch all those that are in contact with them. You have days and nights and relatives and work and school and so many opportunities, you know, that uh, people are watching the Baha'is, see what they're doing. If we can, uh, I remember when I was a new Baha'i, I became, I heard of the faith when I was 17, about, if it weren't for a whole lot of books that you had to read and study before you were allowed to have the interview with the local assembly, 
Yeah, I went to the first fireside. I said, I want to be a Baha'i. So I said, how do you become a Baha'i? The lady of the house, there were about 80 people at this fireside. It was a big meeting. She looked shocked. She said, well, you better find out what it is first. <laughs> well, I thought I kind of caught the glimpse of it in the meeting. Anyway, I realized that was the wrong question. No, I said, no, no, how do people become Baha'is? <laughs> Changed the question. Oh, she said, yes, well, it's a, it's a big job. You know, you, you have to read Baha'u'llah in the New Era. You have to read the Will and Testament of Abdul Baha. You have to read the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah by Shoghi Effendi. And then you need to write an essay why you believe Baha'u'llah is the manifestation for this day and submit it to the local assembly. And if they find that in order, they'll call you in to examine you. <laughs> yeah, that was the 1950s. It wasn't growing very fast. <laughs> the mass teaching came along after that. Um, so I did all of that as fast as I could and tried to meet the local assembly where I was. And the lady, the secretary of the local assembly said, well, it's... A, you know, I don't know what the assembly's gonna say about you wanting to become a Baha'i because they, uh, they haven't met for about seven months. <laughs> oh. Well, I don't wanna be in trouble. Why don't you have me, why don't you call the LA assembly and say that, you know, that you'd be happy if they enrolled me there? She says, young man, the Baha'i Faith is not a social club. You better go home and think about this. <laughs> <laughs> Things got really difficult. Right? So anyway, finally the assembly met and I tried to answer the questions. Somebody warned me, you better know when Mullah Hussein was born. And I, I said I wasn't prepared with that one, you know, really. But anyway, it seems they didn't know so much to ask me anything very serious, so it was worked out all right. But afterwards they said, you know, this is a small house and uh, you could hear the consultation, so would you mind standing in the street while we consult? So I went out and stood in the street. It was about 40 minutes later when they called me. I thought, my God, it was difficult for them to decide. <laughs> Just about never got in the Baha'i faith. And then they called me back in and they said, sorry, we haven't been met. We haven't met for seven months. We had a little business we wanted to do in between bringing you back and telling you that we've accepted your enrollment. And one older man on the assembly says, yeah, we did this last year with a young man and he didn't turn out very well. I hope you're gonna be better than that. <laughs> After that, I started linking up with, you know, Baha'is that were on fire. And most of those Baha'is were on fire were pilgrims coming back from the guardian's table. They were just a fire, so excited about the faith and so excited about teaching. And these are the people that taught me, they said that they had heard the master say, if you're going to meet a person only once, you know, and we're moving around and we see people and or we're standing in line at the bus or something and there's a chance to have a, have a conversation, try to communicate something about the faith. If you're gonna see them over and over, live the Baha'i life. That is, shower them with kindness and love and let them wonder what it is that animates you and how is it you're so different from other people. So that's the challenge we have of trying to live the Baha'i life. Also, they stressed uh, that uh, the Baha'u'llah, in commanding us to teach the faith, he says, but before all else, teach your own self. Primary command. If you do not teach yourself, if you don't absorb the, the range of the revelation, your words will take no effect in the hearts. And uh, Shoghi Fendi in a letter at that time said, uh, the idea of a little knowledge is a dangerous thing fully applies to the teaching work. All right, so many of you are going through the, the Ruhi books. You have some general information. That's part of the collective activity of the faith. It helps you individually. But now as an individual, you used to think of these major books that Shoghi Fendi has said are so essential for our Baha'i understanding, like the Gone, like Some Answered Questions and the Dawnbreakers. All the Baha'is, and particularly the youth, he said, should master the contents of these books. Now, maybe you find it very difficult to read them, or they're not translated in the best manner in your own language, or something like that. So you may want to link, link up, connect with one of the other Baha'i youth, and read it together, or listen to the audio versions of them, so you can find those online also to listen to. 
but quite, quite important to, to think that through. Now, how, how do you communicate the faith to people that you're only seeing once? Well, I'll tell you, that's a challenge. I keep working on that one. Like I'm on the airplane and I, the guy next to me on the plane, I want to tell him about the faith, but you know, how, how do I do that? It's getting more difficult because all of them now have headphones on listening to something else, so you can't even say hello. But hello, what? Excuse me. <laughs> so I had to wait. There's one of these flights to Cleveland or someplace like that in the United States going around. The guy finally took the things off because we were landing and had to put it away. So I greeted, you know, greeted, kind of nodded at him, and we talked a little bit. And I said, you know, I'm new to this place. Do you know where the Baha'is meet here in town? <laughs> <laughs> the who, he says. <laughs> and then opened the way to saying something about the faith. Now, the, now this is proclaim the faith. All right, this sounds... Proclamation has been used in different ways, but in the way that I see Baha'u'llah using it, it's you want to communicate two things. Baha'u'llah's name, who gave teachings, and that's the Baha'i teachings, and they, they address the problems of the world. They bring a solution for the problems we're all facing. So this is what Baha'is are about. What are you going to go see? The Baha'is are I'm going to talk with them. We, we talk about, you know, how to solve the problems of the world, and we have the teachings of Baha'u'llah, who has brought a new set of teachings to solve the problems of men. If you can get that much out, fine. Now, but the, the reaction of most people, I mean, Europe and everybody else like that is, uh, oh, well, that's interesting, or they just don't say anything after that because you're talking about religion and that's just difficult. Uh, or they say, maybe they say, oh, that. What are the what are the teachings say? Or what are the teachings about? That would be the best of all possible responses. Sometimes you get the response that, oh, I'm so glad you found something you like. Yeah. <laughs> Finished. That's the end of the conversation. <laughs> then, then Baha'u'llah says, if they show interest, then teach them. If they show interest, then teach them. They mean you're not teaching the whole Baha'i faith to people who don't have any interest, but you are proclaiming the existence of such a thing, that there is a vibrant Baha'i community all over the world that's working and solving the problems of mankind. Have you heard of it? If you haven't, take this card, Baha'i.org, some website where they can anonymously look at the teachings of the faith. That's very interesting. This, is, this has made a whole new dimension and opportunity for Baha'i teaching, that you can have people go to a website where they don't have to all right, they can get to the wrong website and then they see Baha'u'llah's face first thing or they hear something about four guardians to the faith or there's a lot of screwy things out there. But mostly now there's enough hits on the Baha'i blogs and Baha'i blog and Baha'i teachings.org that those come up first. And it's an easy way to kind of link people into following it. Uh, I'm gonna talk some more about that in the major sessions here that Abdul Baha says very clearly, he said that the Baha'is must be engaged in teaching others all the time, thinking about how to communicate the faith to others, not waiting for the cycle of growth, but supporting the cycle of growth. Not to say don't do that, but don't think teaching is just for once a month or something like that. This is a very, very important element because he said, if you teach the faith, it opens a place within your being that Baha'u'llah can place divine confirmations. But if you're not teaching the faith, he said the confirmations are cut off. If the confirmations of the Holy Spirit, that is the spirit of Baha'u'llah himself, are cut off, there's no growth. No point in being a Baha'i except being busy. And then the Baha'is burn out in the process because they don't keep the feeding themselves spiritually. So they get, you know, they get really tired and they, and there doesn't seem to be any result, and people are pushing them to tell them, no, you're not faithful to the covenant if you're not doing this, and all those things, we have, to, we have to go on with it. We have to go on with it, and sometimes we push through without eagerness. But if we're doing the individual part, we get fired up because these confirmations come to us. The confirmation is the light of Baha'u'llah. 
What does he say? My light is in thee, yet thou from it thy radiance. One has to turn in in prayer and meditation and learn how to connect with these things. And when we want to teach the faith, it becomes we have to turn to him. If we do that, he says that power flows through us to the soul of the listener. It's like a reed. We have to clean the reed, that's us. And then the piper plays his melody. And anybody that's been involved in very much teaching of the faith realizes that at times you find yourself saying things that you never thought of before. And you wonder, how is it possible? I'm answering this or I'm saying this. And just what the person wants to listen to. And then you think to yourself, God, I gotta remember, that's a very good point. I have to remember that next time, you know, if I can remember it. It's wonderful. Baha'u'llah promises that the angels are there. There's a host of angels. That could... We don't talk very much about that. This is a religion, guys. This is a religion. It's full of divine powers and divine grace. How to attract them, how to become an embodiment of them. And that's what attracts other people, especially waiting souls. This fellow was saying, he'd heard in his talk of mine about the tablet of Abdu Baha. Okay, a tablet of, Baha, of Abdu Baha. He talks about various levels of receptivity to the message. Some souls, he said, are like oil with a spark. They light up and they start probably browbeating you. Why didn't you tell me about this before? Why are you keeping this to yourself? This is the most important message anybody could hear. What's the matter with you? You know, you think, I didn't know whether you'd be interested or not, really. You know. Okay, what? That's the first kind. That's the best kind. The second kind, he said, are like green branches. Green branches, you put the fire under them, and it starts to heat them up, and then they sputter and make smoke and hurt your eyes and all kinds of difficulties involved in teaching people. Finally, if you stick with it long enough, the branch catches fire. And then there's a... All right, the third one, he said, they're like rocks. You get near them, you shed your heat, you shed your radiance, and it warms them up, and they look very happy and everything, but as soon as you move away, they cool off again. So you gotta stick very close with those kinds. Now, how to get them from confirmation where they see the truth of the faith and then actually consecrate themselves a big is a big task but not so much with the first kind so Shoghi Effendi says we should focus and ask Baha'u'llah to guide us to waiting souls there are a percentage of souls in the population that are ready and will respond to the cause so much easier he said if you really put your trust in him he will guide you to these souls. Conversely, in another letter, he says, if the friends would learn to live the Baha'i life, Baha'u'llah would send these waiting souls to them. That sounds a lot easier than knocking on doors. You know, all right, you can still knock on doors, but <laughs> we want, you know, you're trying to use your time effectively and get to the get to the point. So he says, if you put your trust in him, if you turn to him, then he sends souls to you, or you will encounter them. Bill Sears, the hand of the cause, used to say, and then I always add a little part to the prayer. I say, okay, Baha'u'llah, if you, if you send me souls, help me to recognize that these are the souls you sent, so I don't, <laughs> I don't say, no, I don't think so, I probably don't be interested. We don't know, you can't tell ahead of time what the cause, what the message is gonna produce in people. But surely it takes a lot of talking to a lot of people to find those waiting souls. Now, if that's the thing, the only thing that really attracts divine confirmations, you can see how important teaching is. So ultimately, teaching is, Abdu'l Baha calls it in the Will and Testament, the greatest gift of God to you. Because that's the thing that's going to develop you into a celestial being that's going to be able to move through other worlds of God and perform tasks and duties in the next life that will be very exciting and wonderful. And in this life also, you'll be a source of joy to those around you and to those you're able to communicate the faith to. It's so, this is so vital that if you can communicate 
divine confirmations and all the prayers are asking, confirm me, make me, I'm a broken winged bird, make me able to convey your message, you know, endow me with a constancy, confirm me with the blessings of the Holy Spirit. All those things are in the prayers. This, this is not pretty talk. This is, these are the means of attracting to our soul these powers. If we're able, he says, to affect, to touch one soul, to attract one soul to the cause of God, when you enter the next world, he says, you will attain the station of a martyr. So we don't have martyrs now. We're not you know, having to offer ourselves in death. But death of self, yes, death of, death of our person, death of the thing we think we want to be in life our personal plans, you know? Sometimes we have to sacrifice those. Shoghi Fendi said, the sacrifices of the Baha'is are three kinds. Financial, give till it hurts, show the sign of your belief in the faith. The second one is the sacrifice of time. We all have, you know, very little time, very little leisure time, it's all scheduled out. We, we fill up our lives with things. We don't like to be sitting doing nothing, usually. We have our favorite sports and our favorite TV programs and our favorite activities. All this. Some of that's got to go so that we have time to do the activities, the collective activities of the faith, and also the individual activities of the faith. Obligatory prayer, essential. Abdu'l-Bahá says it is the cause of the protection of your soul from bad things. He also says there's no excuse before God for not saying it. It's obligatory. Well, he said there's two excuses. One, if you're in bed with a fever and you can't stand up and you can't get out of bed, you're excused. And the other is if you're insane, you know. So if you miss your prayer, which one are you going to choose? <laughs> Serious business, friends. Serious business. Figure out how to tie strings on your finger or something so you don't forget these things until it becomes a habit, you know? I mean, you, my heavens here, at least half of the year, you've got a long time from noon until sundown to say the noon prayer, you know? It gets a little more exciting, I suppose, in the winter when you only have <laughs> noon to two o'clock or something. Yeah. He says you are free to choose one of these three obligatory prayers. One of the obligatory prayers is the medium. It has three prayers a day. Have you ever tried that? It's quite interesting to experiment with the different obligatory prayers. See which one best fits your own feelings. The three one, you need a lot of attention because you've got to get up and do it in the morning and then at noon and then in the evening again within two hours after the setting of the sun. And No comparison, he said, that between the salat, which is the obligatory prayers, and the occasional prayers. The other prayers are powerful prayers, they're useful, but they don't have the, the influence of these obligatory prayers. This is like the foundation of our spiritual life. And the other sets of prayers we use on occasion and when we're, you know, we've, we're sick or we have a family for, with some emergency or a friend that's suffering and we... We use the tablet of Ahmad and others. That also has special power, he says. When he talks about obligatory prayer, he says the tablet of Ahmad and the healing prayer equally have this very special power, potency. So those are things that are like tools of your spiritual life, you know. You're a, he calls the Baha'is would-be warriors fighting in the army of light, carrying light to the darkness of the world. What else are we going to do? Nothing else satisfies you. You know, it's not very, there's so many things to do and they're not very satisfying. How do we engage in an activity that's satisfying? Well, I hope that wasn't a harangue. You know what a harangue is? <laughs> Telling people what to do. Worst thing is telling people what to do and you don't do it yourself. That's, he says, watch out for that one. Your death is better than your life. But I kind of stick my neck out once in a while. I've been doing this a long time, so. 
Yeah, please. You said there were three ways to guide him seven good And I got to two, and you missed the... Yeah, I'd, I'd started with that one, in a, but oh, indirectly, which is person. The sacrifice of our person. The sacrifice of who we want to be in the world. The sacrifice of my third PhD, because really, is that necessary to be able to teach the Baha'i cause, you know? Uh, all kinds of, you know? Or I'm going to... I'm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help the faith after I make my first million. What is this? All the different goals we give ourselves in life and all the different reasons we maybe tell ourselves why we're not teaching. How's the justice kind of hanging on the youth in the world, trusting that they're going to be able to communicate the faith to the next generations? The rest of us old people hanging around the sidelines watching to see what the youth are going to do, please. All right, so there's many questions in this question, but it's regarding like the youth and the destructive forces from society, such as like adultery, uh, backbiting, alcohol, and the way to guide ourselves through that. Because, yeah, Baha'u'llah says like, blah, 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 um, Thou art my lamp and my light is in thee. But at the same time, Sugar Fendi mentions that we cannot segregate the human heart from the environment. Mm -hmm. So we're supposed to be part of the environment and the discourse, but at the same time, not become detached from it. So in what ways can like, us as youth guide ourselves? Because for me, it's not uh, sometimes like, sufficient enough to just read, for example, in the Most Holy Book when they mention, this is not a mere code of laws. That is not enough when I actually sin and make the mistake of maybe doing one of those things. So how do we guide ourselves saying, from those destructive forces that us as youth are facing? Well, you've got a few special aids there. First of all, you have the teachings that tell you what to do, but you have to figure out what are the teachings actually saying. I mean, maybe adultery, you say, oh, that's having sex with somebody who was already married. That's not a good idea. <laughs> but actually, the, in the Baha'i teachings, adultery is any sex outside of marriage and the marriage between a man and a woman. So this is like central intelligence. Okay, but I'm not perfect and I, like, I, slept, I slipped. I slipped and slept and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so the faith is, doesn't say, okay, go, go, go to hell or get run in the hills and hide and yeah, because it can't do that. There's too many of us, and we won't have anybody left. <laughs> it, the, the Guardian had a letter from, from the NSA of Canada saying that they'd spotted a number of homosexuals in the Toronto community. And what should they do about it? And the Guardian said, unless they're causing public sensation, you know, like being the front runner on the gay parade now, I suppose that would be <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Don't bother the people. If you want to investigate the lives of the, the private lives of the Baha'is, there'll be nobody left in the community. <laughs> we have to be very forgiving, very forgetful. We're all in the practice of this thing. But apart from that, Baha'u'llah is given certain, uh, he's given certain prayers Prayers for forgiveness. May you grab a hold of them and use them. They're terrific. Help us. They guide us. They help us. They clear us. Uh, one of them is in, I think it's the Glad Tidings. Is it Glad Tidings 13? Glad Tidings, the, the tablets, of the tablets after the Octas, one of them is Glad Tidings. And I'd have to look it up, but it's either the 10th or the 13th is the prayer for forgiveness, who says when you're in a state of attraction and submission to God, you know, recite this prayer. It really clears your life, it asks forgiveness of everything that you've done wrong or going wrong or might do wrong, and your mother and your father is in it too as well, which helps. Since the Bob says we should be constantly praying for our parents. So that prayer is something that you, you, you want to, um, if we fall down, we want to get up again. That's the, the rule of the faith. 
All right, if we do something terrible, okay, the assembly will punish us, whatever it is, that's, that's another thing. But for the most part, when the House of Justice says, they write and they say, oh, one of the girls in the committee is pregnant and she's not married. They said, yeah, well, somebody should help her, a sister. She needs to take care of her child. Rhea Khanum said she was the guardian secretary. She said a letter came from Africa that one of the pioneers, one of the European pioneers, had gotten an African woman pregnant. Oh, my God. Don't know how he did that, but anyway. <laughs> uh, he, he really liked the, he liked the lady, but I guess he didn't want to marry her, and that was a problem. So the Guardian say, said, when Rui Khanum told him this, she said, well, he'll have to take care of the child. He'll have to provide for the child. Sensible kind of re response, considering that we are weak human beings. Now, Abdul Baha says this is not a world for the demonstration of perfections. I like that line. That's one of the few lines I fulfilled in the Baha'i faith. You know? <laughs> I think you could follow right along with me in that one. <laughs> We're supposed to be trying all the time, but don't knock yourself dead if you're not making the grade, you know? Try to do better all the time. That's the whole idea. We're constantly, there's two things that veil us from attaining the presence of Baha'u'llah in a more uh, conscious way. He said one is self-love and the other is carnal passions, human passions. These are the two big veils. These are things constantly drawing us and away from the spiritual model. The spiritual model is not dull. Look, it's just like full of excitement. I mean, when, when you're really engaged in the war, the clash between light and darkness, this is a terrific activity. <laughs> Nothing more exciting in the world, really. <laughs> If it becomes very dull and routine, then take a good look at it. What, how are we doing it? Are we doing it the right way? You know, you know I don't want to go to the meeting again, or oh, I don't want to go to the study circle, or oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> We're all hearing that. We have to push ourselves a little bit. The cause grows by sacrifice. It does not grow by dutiful activity. It stays steady with dutiful activities at best, but Shoghi Fendi says to grow, it requires sacrifice. That's the fuel of the engine of the cause. Doing something that you think you can't do, doing more, pushing a little more, staying a little longer at an activity that you want to just run away from. All of that is, <clears throat> attracts divine confirmation and releases it. And even, we're not responsible for how people react to the faith. We have to do our best to try to, to give a correct picture of it when we talk about it. But if they're not interested, leave them to themselves. Don't argue with them, don't push them, don't anything. That's all, this is all, that's the proselytizing side that we don't have in the faith. Imagine, you know, the whole world's full of Christians. Everybody knows about Christianity. You're going trying to push somebody to accept Christ. They already accepted Christ or they've lived in a Christian so this is like proselytizing. Come to our church, join our church, join our church. This is something entirely new, the glad tidings, new news that we're giving to humanity. Have you heard of this? You should check it out. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit uh, tough on people sometimes on the airplane, I say. Why are you coming here? I, why are you visiting here? I say, oh, I'm coming to a Baha'i conference. They say, Baha'i, what's that? Is it Baha'i? You haven't heard of Baha'i? <laughs> Boy, I think this is, you know, a subject of interest to, to anybody that's looking for solutions in the world. You should check it out here. It's on this website or something like that. It used to be we had a lot of publicity about, for a long time about the persecutions. So people knew about it. Oh, that's the one that they're, they're punishing in Iran. Yeah. Now we don't, we don't have much of that even. How to create an opening. Back to the subject of asking Baha'u'llah to create a way for it. He says, Baha'u'llah has powers. If you ask him, he can assist in special ways. 
I think somebody had a question. I'm running over the top of your question. Did somebody have a question? Please. Something that we have either faced or will be facing, especially with the system different in Sweden and other countries, is the participation in the, uh, the election of party politics. How is the bias stance on that? Because it's very, yeah. very divided opinions when I've been asking people about it. Yes, you can vote in party politics. No, you cannot. Yeah, you know, the question of uh, party politics uh, puts us in trouble with other countries because here the, our dominant party and something we may be supporting is the opposite of the political uh, tone and atmosphere in another country in Eastern Europe or in Southeast Asia. And they, they, if the Baha'is are pushing themselves, entering party politics, Shoghi Effendi said they will not be able to change anything and the party politics will destroy them. Literally, you will be lost. But if we say, no, no, but we're not interested in politics, that's not true. We need to be keen observers of what's going on all the time. We read the newspaper, Shoghi Effendi read the editorials every day, cut them out of the newspapers, underlined them. He was right on top of what's going on, but not expressing opinions on political matters. That's tough because everybody wants you to have an opinion. Why don't you have an opinion? Show you if any in a letter to the American National Assembly said that the temple guides must be very careful to not mention political figures. That's getting very tough in the States this last year with, with the president that we have. So he said, do not mention political figures and do not introduce political topics. If you're asked opinions on political matters, you say we don't um, participate in partisan politics. The Baha'i community is avoiding that because it's an international community. And our approach to the solution of the world's problems is international, not national. And all these politics that we're dealing with here and in the States and in other countries are all national politics. We're interested in the international, in creating a venue where things can be solved at the international level once and for all for everybody, so to speak. It, it helps, it, it, instead of looking stupid that we don't you know, know anything about what's going on, it's that we have a higher, a higher venue that we're going to, a higher outlook that we want to introduce. But what if it's the voting for an independent politician, let's say, not for actual parties, so you cannot vote for like an independent politician in the US, let's say, uh, like as long as he has affiliated to a political party. I'm hearing part of what you're, you're saying, but not all of it. What are you saying? What, what was, sorry, what's sorry. the question part of it? Uh, no, if you vote for an independent politician that is not connected to... If you vote for? Party, yeah, sure. Well, you can vote for any politician. It's that you don't talk party politics, but Shoghi Finis is out of the candidates. You choose the one that you think is the closest to... Your ideals, that's fine. Voting is okay, but not actively spreading that there. No, I don't know. Some countries you have to join the party in order to vote for the party. Yeah. That's, a, that's another situation. You have to ask the NSA how to proceed in that case. I don't know the situation of all the European countries. It's, it's not you've like got, if you've got to register, you can't vote if you don't register in a party in some places. What's that? Or you can't participate in the election unless you don't join the one national party of the whole country. That's, then you say, well, that's not partisan politics. Yeah, that's right, it's not. <laughs> it's despotism. <laughs> Got other names. Yeah. But certainly we're free to vote. Abdullah encourages it. Yeah. Yes, please having non-Baha'i parents and <laughs> simultaneously remaining the unity in the family but at the same time having spiritual growth within the, for example, the local assembly, going to 19 days feast and stuff like that. What is more important? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question, yeah. I think one has to 
read all the teachings on these things, balance it out and decide where, why should parents keep us from going? Of course, they may be prejudiced from the point of view of their religion. If they have a religious background, they don't like you going to another faith at all. Christianity understands that Christ came to divide father from son. It's there in the text. So it's not an unknown factor in the life of families. After you're 18, you have to start making your own decisions about, about things like that. But try to do it in a loving way and explain that I feel like, you know, to be true to myself, I have to do the things that, I, that my mind understands and that is confirmed in my heart. It's always a challenge. I don't have any Baha'i relatives. Doesn't seem to do a very good job with teaching them. <laughs> I'm half Swedish and I have Swedish relatives. I'm going to see some of them tomorrow. But it's always a challenge too. They won't ask me anything about the faith. But I, I, last time I went to visit them in Greensbo in central Sweden there at the farm, the family farm, I went and prayed at my great grandparents' graves and so on. And uh, nothing, no discussion of the faith at all. I went to the bathroom, which in the farm was an outhouse. I had to walk a ways. And as soon as I was away, they, the, this afterwards, the Persian friend told me, who speaks Swedish, they immediately ask, are there Baha'is in Sweden? Are there Baha'is in my place where I live? Who is this? Who, what activity? <laughs> when I came back, <laughs> Uh, you know some of those people, I'm sure. Yeah, I don't know. Bahá'u'lláh well, Grant, one of them, two of them, some light of conscience to get more curious. One of my, one of my cousins has a con had come to the Holy Land and was on a, a uh, kibbutz serving for a while as a youth. This is like 20, 25 years ago or something. I met her here last when I was here three years ago. And the impression, she was overwhelmed. She said, she was, that was something they did talk about the faith. She said, when I was in Haifa, that, that Oprah and his wife arranged a party with youth from 30 countries that came to greet me. She was so impressed with that. I mean, it was natural in the world. Sense. That was any party was all different countries, you know. I hadn't realized that she was a little bit hesitant at the shrines, like I'm breaking the laws of my faith by entering your shrines. It was a kind of uncomfortable feeling, but she went. My mother, she came out of the shrine of Baha'u'llah, her eyes, oh, what beautiful carpets. <laughs> Bless, bless you, Mother. She's gone her way, and I think she's got a better idea what it's all about now. <laughs> it's not the faith I would have had for you, she said, but it hasn't been too bad for you since I was a was House of Justice member. I mean, she saw the whole business there. <laughs> Quite interesting. Yeah. Question on um, you, you started to go 